Hi, I'm David Dell, president of Man in the Mirror, and I just want to take a minute to talk with you about our Books by the Box program. Some of you are aware that we've seen 8 million books go out through this program through churches and business leaders across the country since the year 2000. What a blessing that God has allowed us, allowed us to touch hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And this year we're particularly excited because we have some great resources available for you. Uh, for example, we have The Measure of a Man, the classic title by Gene Getz, available in the program in boxes of 12 or 48. A wonderful gift for Father's Day. Many other titles for men and women are available, including Pat Morley's newest book, How to Survive the Economic Meltdown, which is a great resource right now for so many folks that are struggling uh, in this situation, wondering what the future holds, wondering what their next steps might be. Practical spiritual strategies for, for folks that are going through tough times right now. Uh, also, we have the classic book on stewardship and money, uh, Randy Alcorn's The Treasure Principle. And so many churches are using this to inform their congregation uh, about the biblical principles of money and stewardship. You know, even though times are tough right now and, and a lot of churches are, are struggling financially, a lot of ministries are struggling financially, the reality is we have to keep investing in our men and women. Uh, we have to do Christian education classes. We have to do small groups. We have to do follow-ups for retreats or events. We, we need to honor our men on Father's Day. We need to bless and encourage the members of our churches uh, even during these difficult times. And, and this program will allow you to do that for less than $2 per book. And so I'm asking for your help. If, if you haven't ordered, would you order books for friends, co-workers, church members this year? Uh, secondly, uh, we really need you to spread the word. You know, the only way this program works is, first of all, donors help underwrite it. But, but secondly, the economies of scale. We need to, to sell enough books to make the program work. And so we really need your help. Maybe you know some pastors, some Christian leaders in your community, an association or a group of folks that you could spread the word to let them know. Go to www.maninthemirror.org and right there you'll see the information for Books by the Box and it can give you great classic Christian literature for under $2 a box that can bless the men and women of your city and your church for the glory of Jesus Christ. And good morning, men. I'm the other speaker. I guess that means I'm kind of like the bench. I'm coming off the bench, sort of. So hopefully I can do as good as the magic bench has been doing, you know, and sort of the second string guy. That's okay, though. If you're, if you're behind Pat Morley, you're doing okay. So, Well, I want to continue the, the shout-outs that we've been doing to some of the folks around the country that are using our webcast using the Bible study and the extension of the ministry that, that we have together here in this place. And this morning we want to uh, give a little uh, shout out to Kevin Meckling and the group that meets in Buff Bluffton, Indiana. They meet every Saturday at 7 a.m. And uh, Kevin uh, came, to the, uh, with, uh, came to the annual summit in January. They've been doing the Bible study for a while and uh, wrote us an email and said they've been watching the marriage prayer series and let us know how much of an impact it's had in their lives. As a matter of fact, it's been so impactful on him that he is actually finding and throwing away his wife Michelle's Splenda wrappers. Okay, so there's some dedication if, you, uh, if you're going that far, you know, to actually pick up trash after your wife. So uh, Kevin was telling us about the impact that this is having in his community. So we want to give a shout out to that group there in Bluffton, Indiana. So let's all give them a hand. Go get them, guys. And this week, we're continuing our series on how to survive the economic meltdown. What are some strategies for this meltdown that we find ourselves in? Uh, some of us are being impacted directly and, and significantly by the meltdown. Uh, all of us, of course, know friends or, or neighbors or uh, co-workers, family members that are being impacted in, in tremendous ways by this. And so we're doing a four-part series that uh, kind of jumps off from the book that uh, all of you received and goes into some different areas to flesh that out a little bit more. And so this, this week, we want to talk about why does God have his thumb on the planet? Why does God have his thumb on the planet? Last week, Pat kind of gave you a big idea that was really a, a big idea for the whole series. 
And that is that God is sovereignly orchestrating all human events to bring us into right relationship with him and right relationship with one another. God is sovereignly orchestrating all human events to bring us into right relationship with him and right relationship with one another. And so that's a way of talking about the big picture of what God's doing. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it's not painful. It doesn't mean that it's not confusing. It's not difficult. And so uh, one of the other points that, that Pat made was that, uh, that, that this is not unprecedented, what's happening today. We've had uh, financial corrections. We've had banking crises in the past. You know, the level of it and the depth of it and how long it lasts, all of that remains to be seen, whether that is unparalleled. But the idea or the, or the uh, essence of what's going on is not unprecedented in our history. And this morning, I want us to look at a, a place that shows us that it's also not unprecedented in biblical history. You know, it's always a good thing to take your situation and go to the scriptures and see if you can find examples of someone or, or, or a people or a time when the same kind of thing was going on and see if there are not some lessons and some parallels that you can bring. So if you look at Haggai chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1, uh, we're going to read, read this together, verses 1 through 11. And uh, this is an incredible description of uh, inflation and economic uncertainty, recession, depression, however you want to you put it, uh, as, as the, the people of God were experiencing. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what they experienced and then the lessons that that gives us for us today. Haggai chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 1. On August 29th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house, the temple. So the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider how things are going for you. You have planted much, but harvested little. You have food to eat, but not enough to fill you up. You have wine to drink, but not enough to satisfy your thirst. You have clothing to wear, but not enough to keep you warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider how things are going for you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvest, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord Almighty, while you are all busy building your own fine houses. That is why the heavens have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olives and all your other crops, a drought to starve both you and your cattle and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. May God add understanding to the reading of his holy word. Now, what are we talking about here when we look at the book of Haggai? The book of Haggai takes place after the exile. Uh, we know about uh, uh, King David and King Solomon and then the division of the, the nation of Israel into Israel and Judah. Uh, Israel is taken over by the, uh, the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Eventually, Judah is defeated by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., and that's when we have the captivity and the story of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and, and all of those stories that we read about in the Bible. Uh, and after 70 years, the, the Jews were allowed to come back to Israel by Cyrus. And so they returned to Jerusalem, but of course, after 70 years, and in the temple having been destroyed by the Babylonians during that siege, uh, the, the city is a shell of what it was. And so they are commanded to begin that rebuilding. And we read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah as they begin this rebuilding effort. But things stall out. Things don't go as they planned. Uh, they, they begin to get caught up in their own safety, their own security. And uh, the temple lies there with some kind of a foundation laid, but no real development, no real progress on rebuilding the temple. And so God raises up this prophet Haggai to call the people to finish the work that they had begun. And that's what we see in this passage. These, this remnant of the nation of Israel, there in this city that's a shell of its former glory, 
uh, uh, probably experiencing all kinds of discouragement, all kinds of uncertainty, economic, political, uh, social uncertainty. But God says, you need to finish the work that I've called you to do. And when we think about what God was calling them to do, we really have to place it in, in, the, in the whole of biblical history. Because um, what he was calling them to do was to rebuild his temple. Now, what was important about his temple? Well, if we go all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, there's two concepts that we see right there at the, at the very beginning uh, in creation. One is God's presence. God's presence with Adam and Eve. God's presence in the garden. God's presence in creation. The fellowship that they had together. Uh, that is an, a part of who we are meant to be as humans and a part of the relationship that God established with us as our covenant Lord, as our God, is that he was to be in relationship with us that we were to live in his presence. But of course, that doesn't last, right? We see that uh, get broken by the fall and sin. A second thing that we see in the, in the very beginning is God's glory. God's glory is revealed in the creation. It's revealed as he uh, continues to create things in, in his image, showing his, uh, his incredible power uh, over the universe. So a, a, a part of what's going on in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is establishing God as the, as the true God against all the other gods that were out there. Think about, for example, one of the gods that was uh, worshipped in Egypt is what? The sun god, right? So what, is God, what does the true God do in Genesis chapter 1? Let there be light. And there's light. He is the true God greater than the false gods of the nations. God is glorious. And so this theme of God's presence and his glory begins in Genesis chapter 1. And you can trace that theme all the way through the scriptures. All the way through the scriptures. You can go through the patriarchs and, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their present, the God's presence in their life and their pursuit of, 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 a, of a, a land that would be for God's people, a place where he could be glorified, a place where really a, a new Eden could be created. God's presence could be among his people. You go to uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness and where they went in and God was there with his, using the Ark of the Covenant as his footstool and they could be in the presence of God's glory, eventually building that temple in Jerusalem under Solomon, a place where God would dwell with men and they could experience his presence into the New Testament where the, the, the scriptures teach us that Jesus is the new temple, that his body is the incarnate presence of God with us, that he is the living embodiment of the glory of God with us. And then we become the temple of God uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19, Ephesians 2.21, that we as God's people become his temple, that he inhabits us through his Holy Spirit so that we become the place where God's presence and his glory dwells. So this theme of God's presence and God's glory is a part of the, the, the arc of salvation that God is doing, the big story that God is telling throughout history. And right here, smack dab in the middle of it, are these few little exiles in this rundown city dealing with all the stuff that they had to deal with, and God had called them to a great calling to finish his temple to finish his temple, to, to create that place where, where his presence and his glory could be seen by the world. Now, what does this mean for us today then? We know what they were called to do. We know the difficulty that they were having. We know what it faced. But, but tell me how this applies to me, because I've got all kinds of different challenges. I'm not trying to build a physical temple. I'm not sitting in a group of exiles. I'm living in modern America. What does this mean to me? Well, what, the reason that this is so important is because, you know, we all build things. And uh, I, I have three kids, and uh, they all enjoyed building uh, things at different points in their lives, some of them more than others. But if you had children or grandchildren, you've probably played with blocks. You've probably played with blocks. Now, these are, these are some awesome blocks, by the way. Uh, these things have been through a lot by now, and they still, still work perfectly. And, and it's fun to build with blocks. You know, you can sit on the floor, and you can... You can build towers, you can build houses, you can do all kinds of things. And uh, as a kid, and with your children, it, it's a lot of fun. It's enjoyable. But you know, if you were, are an adult, an adult man, or an adult woman, and you're sitting around your house, and you're spending your time setting up blocks all day long, that's a little bit scary, isn't it? 
That's a little bit scary. It doesn't make any sense. And so what happens is we move on to other things. We think that they're bigger and better things often that we are investing our time and energy in. And, uh, and but yet sometimes we find out that they're really just an adult form of these children's blocks. I'll give you an example of this uh, cl that's pretty close to home up there at the uh, South Carolina, uh, I mean the Florida Georgia border uh, is uh, an island called Cumberland Island. How many of you have been to Cumberland Island? Raise your hand if you've been to, okay. Several of you have been to Cumberland Island. On Cumberland Island, there is a, a homestead that the Carnegies used. It was first uh, actually first built by Nathaniel Green, the Revolutionary War uh, general. And then uh, after that, it was built, uh, rebuilt by the Carnegies as a, as a uh, home for them. It's, uh, in places four story tall, it's called Dungeness, four stories tall. Uh, in the late 1800s, it had indoor swimming pool heated. It had a billiard room. It had every luxury that you could imagine built there on Cumberland Island. And you can see what an incredible, if you, if you went to see a home like this at 1890 or 1885 or 18, what, what an incredible sight that would have been to see something like that. It, it's pretty glorious, right? Pretty glorious. Well, here's the view of Dungeness today. It was abandoned in the early 1900s, 1959. The rest of the structure burned down. And this is all that remains of its glory. And so you see what happens for so many of us is we switch from building maybe with children's toys, but we start building with adult toys. And we start building with the things that as guys we give ourselves to, whether it's our business or our career, our family, our reputation, our power, our homes, our hobbies, having fun, whatever all these things are that we invest ourselves in. And the world is out there. It is trying to deceive us. It's trying to distract us by lesser things. And as a matter of fact, it is perfectly designed to distract us with lesser things. The world, the flesh, and the devil are constantly asking us to focus our attention on things that are not of ultimate value. And so we live our lives, and, 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 it's, and the world's getting better and better and better at it today with, with the internet and, 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 and uh, television, entertainment, movies, hobbies. I mean, think about the ways that you can use your money today versus 150 years ago. If you were alive 150 years ago and you would have had 10% more cash, then you might have been able to buy a better plow or a bigger saw blade or maybe have meat a few more times a year, right? But today you can get video games, home theaters, go on a ski trip, mountain biking. I mean, you know, take uh, martial arts classes. I mean, on and 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 on, right? distractions that the world is presenting to us to, to take us away from ultimate things. And so what I think we see at the, in the lesson, that one of the lessons we see in Haggai is the need to give ourselves to a great cause. The need to give ourselves to a great cause. These guys were suffering. They were there in this, in this shell of a city. Uh, they were a small remnant. They were beleaguered on, on every side from, from competitors and, and enemies. And yet God said, in the midst of this, you need to give yourself to a great cause. You need to be involved in something that matters. And what I've called you to do is be a part of this redemptive history, this salvation story that I'm doing. You need to rebuild my temple. And so one of the things I think we ought to ask ourselves is, what is the great cause that we can be involved in? What is the great cause? How can we join God in his story of bringing redemption and transformation to the world? Are we involved in a great cause? But you know, today, it's even more of a shame when we get so distracted by these things that, that take us away from ultimate things. And the reason for that is that we are, a different, we are at a different point in this ark of salvation than they were in the book of Haggai. Here, they're in the middle of the story. And they're being called by God to rebuild this temple. They don't know what's going to happen with it. They know it's not going to look like Solomon's temple. We get to chapter 2, you see this. Uh, they know it's not going to be anything particularly special. 
Uh, and yet, today, where are we today in this salvation story? Well, we're a long way from there. We've, we've seen the rebuilding of that temple under Herod. We've seen the coming of Jesus Christ, the true temple, the final temple. We've seen his death and his resurrection. We've seen the gospel begin to go forth into every tribe and tongue and nation. We've seen today uh, what happens with that. And so God has given us a new place in this salvation story. We have the place of being able to point backwards to what Jesus Christ has done and invite people to become a part of his kingdom with us. That's our place in bringing God's presence and God's glory into this world, that we should be the temple of God together and that we should share his stories with others. It's also a shame when we miss it because we, it's a unique time in history because of the rise of Christianity around the world. Christianity is on the move. We often hear about the growth of Islam, and Islam is growing very quickly, not, not a, mostly by population growth, but also through some conversions and those kinds of things. But you know what? Christianity is on the rise as well. Christianity is spreading throughout the globe. There's a lot to be excited about in terms of what God is doing around the world. Uh, it won't be long until uh, China becomes the, world's, the, the country in the world that has the largest population of Christians. Within the next probably decade, China will be the country in the world that has the largest population of Christians. Uh, Korea had less than 300,000 Christians in 1930. Today, it's over 12 million Christians, and they are the second largest missionary force around the world from South Korea. Countries in Africa that have, many of them had a minuscule percentage of Christian, now have 10, 20, 25, 30, 35 percent Christian believers in their countries. God is at work. South America, the center of Christianity is moving away from the West. It's moving to South America, to Africa, to Asia. God is on the move, and we live in a unique time in history. The third reason that we live at a unique time in history is that we live in a time where it is possible to literally reach the world. The first time in history that this has ever been true, that we, it is literally possible for us to reach the world. With the advances in technology, with the advances in um, travel and transportation, uh, energy, uh, all of the communication, it is possible for us to reach the world. It's never been true before. What an incredible time that God has allowed us to live. Uh, just a couple of examples of this. One is, uh, one is Google. Uh, think about Google for a second. In 1997, Google didn't exist. September of 1998, a little homepage went live without much fanfare, and now 11 years later, Google is a $100 billion company. It's never been true, in, basically, in the history of the world, other than discovering oil or a gold mine or something like that, a big one, that you could have created a company that would have 11, $100 billion of value in 11 years. Why is that possible? The only reason it's possible is because today we have the ability to coalesce and to, to grab large numbers of people quickly because of what technology allows us to do. Here's another example, and this one is uh, something that uh, probably no one in the, let's see if anybody in the group knows who this is. Anybody know who this is? This is a challenge about it, whether you have eight-year-old children or grandchildren that you spend a lot of time with. Okay, this is a, is a young man. His real name is, and I do not know how to pronounce his last name, but Lucas Quickshank. Uh, but his stage name is Fred Figglehorn. And what Lucas did, he lives in Nebraska, Nebraska, about two years ago. He's 15 now. About two years ago, what he did was he took his home camcorder and he began to record little video vignettes. And he recorded them as if he was a six year old boy. And after he recorded them, he re-edited the audio to give himself a high-pitched voice. Now, if you ever have to actually watch one of these, you will see how annoying it is to anyone over the age of eight years old. <laughs> but he gave himself a high-pitched voice. Now, for comparison's sake, I did some research. The highest rating, rated cable shows in uh, February of this year, okay? The cable-only stations, not broadcast, but cable-only stations, the highest rated one had just over six million viewers. So these series that are on, you know, whatever stations, TNT, you know, HBO, whatever. The highest rated one of those had 6 million viewers. Uh, 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 law, uh, 24 a few weeks ago had 10 million viewers on broadcast, okay? 10 million viewers. 
Now, Lucas uh, put these little shows up on YouTube. And uh, over the last two years on YouTube, uh, he has had over 250 million views of his videos. The first person to a million subscribers, and his top rated video, their top viewed video, is, has been seen 26 million times. Remember now, these producers, these, these uh, cable stations, these writers, go to all the trouble, millions of dollars, and they craft this show. The highest rated one is seen by six million people. A 13-year-old boy with a camcorder in his backyard and a PC, 26 million people. It's the first time in history that it's ever been possible to reach the world. This webcast that we do here, we, we spend less than 1% of the money that it would have taken to do a single broadcast of television 10 years ago. And yet this next week, people from over 50 countries, tens of thousands of people from over 50 countries will be watching this Bible study. This, you could not have done this 10 years ago. This was not possible 25 years ago. God has put us in a unique time in history where it's actually possible to reach the world. That's why our vision at Man in the Mirror is not just to help some churches start a Bible study or it's not just to, um, you know, to see some men read some books or something like that. Our vision is to help reach every man in America with a credible offer of Christ and the resources to grow. Every man in America, 69 million men in America do not know Christ. And listen, it's time to not just see ones or twos or threes of those people reached and some churches that, you know, sort of stabilize and do okay and don't go out of business or don't have to shut their doors. No, it's time to see 69 million men reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need a big vision. We need to give ourselves to a great cause. Other ministries are out there. They're training leaders internationally. They're planning churches around the world. They're uh, involved in feeding children and, and, and reducing poverty and bringing education into places where there's never been education for kids. I mean, these big, this is the kind of challenges we ought to be taking on today because God has given us the tools and the opportunity that we've never seen before in the history of the world. You know, uh, my son Ryan is graduating today from high school. It's a little crazy to think that uh, we're already here, as those of you who've been through that can imagine. And uh, that causes you to be a little reflective uh, for yourself, but also for him. And as I was thinking about the kind of charge that, that I would give to a graduate today, you know, I was thinking, did you often hear about things like, you know, um, you know making a difference and, and, and making sure that you keep your priorities straight and, and loving people and valuing relationships, all of which are, are incredibly, incredibly important. But, you know, when you think about this place that we are in history, that we're at a place where, where Jesus has, has come, he has died, he's, he's ro risen from the dead, and we have this story to tell. When we see Christianity on the rise, God is at work with this, this wave, a tsunami around the world. When we see the, the technology and the, the affluence and the resources that God has given us, I believe that it's time for a big challenge. I believe it's time to say, you know what? Where is it that God wants you to literally transform the world? How can you join with somebody that's going to do something great in your life? That's what I want for my son. I would love to see him give his life to something that really does make a difference for Jesus Christ. And so the question that I think we ought to ask ourselves is, are we seizing the opportunity? Are we seizing the opportunity? You know, what if God is trying to get our attention in this to give ourselves to something great? That's what he says in Haggai 1. He says, look, I'm doing this. Now, I can't sit here and say that this is God's judgment on America because of A, B, C, D, or this is God's judgment on the church because of A, B, C, D. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying in Haggai it was because he says it was. I am doing this. I am the one who is making it so you can't harvest your crops. That's what he says. So what if God is trying to get our attention? What if God is trying to say to us, look, you've been focused on your little block houses long enough, okay? I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to pry those blocks from your fingers if I have to, because I want you to give yourself to something great. You know, what if he was to say, what if God wanted to say to us, you know, um, the money that you spend on luxuries, 
don't want to step on too many toes here, but the luxury we spend on our, our cars or our cable or our whatever, what if, what if we spent half as much of that and gave the rest to missions? What would that look like? What about the money we spend on food? Most of us in this room probably could live just as well spending half as much money on food. If we bought generics or different products or didn't go out to eat as much or ate what we should eat instead of what we shouldn't eat or, you know, whatever, okay? That's just a half. What if, what if we said, I'm going to live on half as much food, money, and I'm going to try to feed some poor people who don't have anything to eat? What if God was trying to get our attention to call us to something radical, to something great? The big idea for today is this. The only building worth building is God's building. The only building worth building is God's building. Now, I don't mean that you don't have a career. I don't mean that you don't take care of your house and your lawn. I don't mean that you don't get to play golf when you want to play golf or whatever. I'm not, I'm not trying to be legalistic about it, but what I am saying is that in all of those things, if you aren't doing them as an expression of your being a part of God's story in the world, right? If you're not engaged in them from the perspective of, I'm doing this because I want to be a part of what God is doing to transform the world, to bring his presence and his glory into reality, then what you're really doing is you're sitting around playing with blocks. That's what I'm saying. The only building, you know, what happens with, with these things is they fall down and they get destroyed. The only building worth building is God's building. So there are two lessons from this uh, passage that I want us to see in particular as we close today. The first one is that whatever God uses to get your attention is a blessing, not a curse. Whatever God uses to get your attention is a blessing, not a curse. You know, Pat talks about this from his own experience, how when, when he was flying high in business, you know, people, he could tell that people would look at him and say, wow, he is so blessed, right? Meanwhile, he's realizing he's getting trapped in this materialism. He realizes he's getting deeper and deeper in, in, in debt, and, uh, and he's seeing it as a curse. And then as God unravels it and forces him to let go of some of these things and figure out how to get out of these things and stop getting deeper and deeper into a hole, uh, and the business starts to go down, he could tell that the same people are looking at him now and saying, wow, he is really cursed. I wonder what he did. <laughs> wonder why God's doing that to him. And meanwhile, inside, he's thinking, this is the bl biggest blessing I've ever experienced. Because God was using it to get his attention. God was using it to get him to give himself to ultimate things. You know, when God pulls us back from sin, it may be painful. If, uh, if your wife found the sites that you visited on the computer, okay? Somebody, some people in this room have had that happen. Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, some of you have gotten involved in a place where you started down a path of maybe misleading some folks. And you got a few steps into it and somebody said, now wait a minute, you told me... And even though it was painful, you had to say, well, you know what? You're absolutely right. Uh, that's, that's the truth, and I was, I was uh, misleading you. And when, it, when God does that, it's painful, but it's a blessing, not a curse, because he's saving us from getting farther down the line where we're going to experience even worse consequences. The second thing that we see in this passage is how do we handle disappointment and discouragement? We're not going to look at it, but if you turn to Haggai 2, you would see that these folks were discouraged. It says here, uh, how many of you uh, remember, is there anyone who can remember this house, the temple, as it was before? In comparison, how does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. You can imagine what it would be like to be there in this city that's a ruin of its former glory. You don't have resources. You don't have craftsmen. You don't have money. And you're supposed to rebuild this temple, and some people, at 70 years, some people who were very young children still remember now, in their old age, what it used to look like. And how disappointing it must be to know, to think that, you know, we could never do anything like what it used to be. It's so, I tell you what, it's discouraging for me, you know. <coughs> I'm trying to run a business, and you don't have enough resources. You can't do what you need to do. You can't pay everything. You wonder how you're going to make it through the summer. And some of you guys in the room are facing the same thing in your business life, in your personal life with the bills. Stress in relationships. Um, stress in your family. Stress on friendships and partnerships. How do you handle discouragement and disappointment? Well, what it says here in, in chapter 1, verse 13, 
and in chapter 2, verse 4, is that God is with you. God is with you. He's with you in the midst of your disappointment. One of the things I did in this research was um, read a sermon that a, a pastor named John Piper preached in 1982. 1982, he had just been called to become the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bethlehem Baptist Church had been the leading church in its denomination in the 1950s, had over a thousand people attending, gave all kinds of money to missions, started churches around the world, uh, was on television, radio, the whole thing. But by 1980, they had 300 people huddled together in their mostly dark building. And the average age was uh, well up there in years. They took a chance on this uh, college uh, professor, never been a pastor, named John Piper. He came, he preached, and became their pastor. And one of the sermons that he preached early was a sermon on this passage. And he talked about how it doesn't look like it used to look here. We don't have the glory that we used to have. And some of you are going to be discouraged about it. But God is with us. And he didn't know how prophetic that sermon was because today... There are over 5,000 worshipers on multiple campuses at Bethlehem Baptist Church. But not only that, they've planted churches all around the world, literally. They've developed uh, uh, strategies and conferences and associations that influence pastors and leaders all across the world out of this one church. Why? Because God was with them. God is with them. So when you feel yourself becoming discouraged, you need to focus on the bigger picture. Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. For this is what the Lord of heaven's army says, In just a little while I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. So there's this incredible future prophecy that, that, that God gives to Haggai and to the people saying, look, what you're doing here is part of a story that's a lot bigger than you know. And eventually, I'm going to be glorified in this place, in this temple. And, and if you look at, at the story of the New Testament, there's a very striking parallel in Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 26. This, of course, is the description of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, the new temple that one day will be brought down. It says this, I saw no temple in the city. Why don't we need a temple? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. We don't need to rebuild a physical temple. The Lamb is the temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, the presence and the glory. The glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. Now listen, the nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day, because there is no night there. And all, their, all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Do you see what John is describing? He's describing the fulfillment of the prophecy that God gave through Haggai to the people. It's going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so when we focus on this bigger picture, even in the midst of our discouragement, we recognize that there's a victory coming. God's presence and God's glory is going to be in the midst of his people. And kings and people from every tribe and nation around the world are going to come and are going to worship him. And we get to be a part of that story. So what do you need to let go of today? Is there something in this meltdown that God is, is trying to wrench from your cramped uh, fingers that you've been holding on to so tightly, and this is the only way he could possibly get it from you, is to bring something like this? What is your place in his story? Where does God want you to join him in transforming the world? The only building worth building is God's building. The only building worth building is God's building. Dare to risk, dare to be radical, dare to go beyond anything that you could ask or imagine for his glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning that uh, even when we get caught up in the midst of our difficult circumstances that uh, are really painful, that they really hurt, 
We really don't know exactly what we're going to do or what the right choices are. That we can lift our eyes, that we can see a bigger picture, that we can see a bigger story, your story. And God, I pray that you would use this meltdown in my life to do whatever you need to do in me. Whatever you want to take away, wherever you want to refocus my mind and heart and eyes, God, would you do that? I pray that for these men in this room. As painful as it is, we know it's a blessing and not a curse if you use it to draw us to you. And Lord, for men all across this country, 69 million men who don't know you, millions of men who need a deeper walk with you, God, would you use this meltdown to transform hearts and minds Show us our place in your story. Let us dare to risk. Let us dare to do something great. Let us dare to sacrifice so that you might receive the glory and honor and praise that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.